Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. She's back again. She, you know, the first time we talked, I was gonna hit all these awesome subjects, and then you, I asked you something, and then we, somehow we got onto the space, and then how it was all like a conspiracy in my head, and then you started, you turned the tables on. Only me. in what? your head, Robbie. I don't believe that it was a conspiracy, <laughs> and in fact, I recently had another conversation about that, and I thought about you and about our conversation that we had. Look, I'm leaving memories. If they're good or bad, I'm still there. <laughs> You didn't change my mind about that one, but that doesn't mean I'm not always open to a different point of view than my own. What about Flat Earth? No, don't even go there. <laughs> Look, I've, right. I've talked to astrophysicists, and then my my like childhood hero is a 100% Flat Earther. So I'm like, right, I tell, love- Tell me why. I want I want to hear that explanation well, from the physicist. <laughs> I mean it. When I was ready. when I was talking to the wonderful Dr. Serene Nemi, she was, you know, she entertains it. She laughs at it. You know, it's a kind of it's I mean, it, I like to keep an open mind. I don't think I think through a, at least last time that we talked, I've kind of sorted out this ideal that through all the conversations I've had that there is not one final answer on anything as much as we know that water is known as H2O to another Fair creature, enough. to another thing coming down here, for instance, like just let's, let's take aliens, for instance, for so long, we wouldn't even entertain the idea. There might've been some hints and news or something like that. And then in the COVID-19 relief bill, there was stuff about extraterrestrial life and information that they were going to release about unidentified flying objects. So I'm just like, man, is it the information hasn't come out yet? Do we not know it? I have no clue, but it had me thinking about like my one buddy, does a podcast where he gets all these insane like uh masonry people i've talked to a few masons and stuff like that like um, free freemasons yeah i mean I, I tried to become one on an episode but he's one of the main lodge leaders in london shout out to him dr david harrison but it, it's the roots are actually in scotland so here's it's a really interesting group here's a, here's a good thought for you do you think that there's things instilled into every single part of every society, every civilization, that means UK, America, whatever you want to talk about, that there's parts to it from the very beginnings that are still able to kind of be like little secrets or little hidden information or knowledge or ways to get through still today that are still being used. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I do believe that there is kind of a, a, a cultural elite, shall we call it, a chosen whatever. I'm not sure that it's it's purposefully inculcated at the roots, as I think is what you are asking me. You know, I think it just happens. I think some people are always going to have more than others, more power, more resources, more, you know, it's sort of um, social currency for what, for what it, want of a better word. So I do think there's always something of a secret society. Was it planned? I don't think so. Well, I mean, even if you look at like, for instance, you're an anthropologist, so yeah, studying past things and looking at what have we really examined or looked at in the future as what we're doing now compared to back then. I mean, like we were talking about before the first time we talked all about perspectives of things from like Christopher Columbus, you know, when I was freaking out because at that time I figured out that his teeth were made of slave teeth and not made of cherry wood. But you're like, yeah, that wouldn't really fit in the books. You know, that wouldn't be <laughs> something you'd be very happy to learn about. But I think it's all the mindset of back then too. When they were writing these things, the main thing that you really wanted to do was show how big you were, how tough you were. And that doesn't really work today. Yeah. You know, I, I think, well, the perspective thing is critical. And so, you know, back to what you said a couple minutes ago, I am always happy to hear an explanation for something that I don't believe, or I don't think makes sense, you know, which is what we, we ended up spending our whole time talking about basically the moon landing and conspiracy theories. And so, you know what, I, I personally, from what I know now, and, and incidentally, also from what I understand in my limited knowledge of the laws of physics, don't think the earth is flat, but I'd actually love to hear somebody's rationale why. And if it's really well argued, I'm always open to having my mind changed. I mean, that, that's what anthropology is. It, it's, it's about entertaining other points of view, fundamentally. Sometimes it's really hard to argue with someone on that certain topic when they are 100% convinced and then it's just like there's not even an engagement or a conversation, it, which is like the unpublished episode I have that went three hours long where it was 10 minutes of me talking Whoa. and then I was just like, I don't know what's going on. Um, 
it, but it makes what were they so sure of other than God? I, well, I mean, honestly, I can accept somebody who's just like, you know what? I believe in God because we all are looking for meaning. And as long as they're not shoving it down other people's throats or, or, um, you know, doing violent things to defend their belief against all comers, you know, that I can sort of say, well, yeah, that's for you. That's you. That, that you do you. But what, what was this person talking about for three hours? I would, it's, well, about, you can't see the curve of the earth. You can't see this. And I'll, I'll, every kind of example, and I've, it's not really necessarily what he was also saying, but also when I started after that conversation, I had to research some information about this and some debates about this because I have been told by an evolutionary biologist, I thought we came from apes. I swear to you, I thought we came from apes. And then I was talking to him and he goes, no. And I'm like, what, then why is everyone I talk to think that there's this ape thing that we've evolved from some type of hominid? or sometimes so officially i'm out of that realm i don't i don't think anybody that gives me an answer saying no we actually came from the i no no no, no. i don't i've heard mars theories that make sense to me i'm just I, I everybody's got like this and you see it with fan fiction or some types of movies people develop their own theories in movies and films like there's two mark hamels in star wars one's taller than the other and different no, scenes there's not yeah, there's not but people create Maybe, this whole you know, entire story Tom Cruise, he's he's really short in real life but he looks a little taller in films it, those are called risers in your shoes yeah, even the lips. late great prince wore those patrick swayze That's wore them okay. all the time did he yeah patrick swayze used to stand on like a uh, little uh blocks and stuff in scenes just because he wanted to be taller well, like he... i didn't know he, was he actually like on the shorter side or did he just want to be taller than he was he's probably around my height like maybe five nine five eight that's that's not so short yeah, but compared to if he's doing a movie with Rob Lowe, who's like 6'1 or something, it's going to be a little bit yeah. like, we need to make you a little bit smaller. Yeah, or Elle McPherson or, you know, one of those women that <laughs> to look good next to. But I don't think he was in a movie with her, was he? These theories, though, they make sense because the way that they can kind of create this narrative and fill every single plot hole where you can bring up a point and then you really can't be argued to. Now, with them, I... I understand their rationale with it. I'm not a flat earther. I don't think so at all. And honestly, my point was I've gotten so high before that I could feel the earth rotate. So I'm just saying well, I I understand. Wow. Like, you're just sitting there kind of like, okay, I'm definitely. And how does that work? Right Is that that it's so you're so relaxed that you're just kind of shut down and, and feeling the earth? I think probably much like now, correct me if I'm wrong here. There, when the meteor hit Earth and wiped out, I guess what you would say, the dinosaurs, um, there was a hum for I don't know how long the hum lasted, but the Earth literally rang. And I, I, I thought, did that ringing ever go away or is it kind of like the hum with your refrigerator? Did we just tune it out because we've been so after years upon years and generations, we've kind of grown to ignore it? You know, it's a interesting thought, at least that I've kind of come up with with thinking about this. And I think that's what you have to tackle with anything from flat earth. You can't say it's wrong. You got to get a hit from open mind. And when I was watching this debate, they had NASA scientists and then they had flat earthers and all the flat earthers obviously were heavily religious. And they were like, you know, mm. everything the Bible says it. That's always <laughs> the main conclusion. And the scientists were like, no, there's evidence. But their point was, well, NASA's lied to us before, and I'm not talking about the space, the space landing. I'm talking about when it comes to photos of the Earth. They do CGI parts of the Earth to make it look a little bit clearer and crisper and better for portraits or better for things to display to the public when they're doing a national like, here's a photo from Earth. When they're going to display it to people, they're going to clean it up a bit. And they've been known, and it has been articles that have been found out where they have put like clouds or they've added a couple things or erased a couple things used photo effects to be able to make it look nicer just so the public can receive it better so that's their that's their main thing is like if they lied to us once why would they why wouldn't they why would they just stop I, lying to us again i think that's such an interesting interpretation of that sort of enhancement of media <laughs> who doesn't enhance their media does that mean that everybody who uses a filter and in instagram is lying <laughs> i mean yeah i don't yeah. know it, it seems so. a little bit yeah, I mean, fair enough. But well, well, the well, I, I just the, the example is, or the or their mindset is that 
and it, it, I, I believe it to be true is when you lie to someone, instead of being honest, like we we're talking about the George Washington thing, for instance, that right. you are already incentivizing them to not want to trust you again. You're, you're, you're creating true. trust issues, no matter how big the task is, or no matter how small the task is, where now people, there's this giant trend that you're probably seeing much like I've seen and much like probably the world is getting known and hip to is trying to expose things where social media is becoming the major tool in this area. I mean, the podcast that I was talking about um, before we started recording was with Josh Rogan, who was on a Joe Rogan podcast exposing so much. Is he related? Is it nepotism? Are they they related? It's just like how my last name's Robertson. I'm not related to half the Robertsons. I like to think so, though. If I see a person with the same name as me. Robbie Robertson. I mean, I don't know. That immediately makes me want to go make a playlist. I'm a drug dealer. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Are you? (laughs) I I didn't hear that. I'd Actually, be, drugs are rapidly being legalized. You, you'll be okay. Just hang loose a little longer before they you just, know it. You can... They just legalized prostitution in New York. They did? I yeah. missed that. I mean, that's not that's not bad. I don't. I've talked to a couple brothel. No, keepers. I think that's probably a good thing. Honestly, would you do it less though? I haven't done it. I'll, I'll be perfectly upfront, but I, I mean, I think that it it creates a safety net for sex workers and frankly, for their patrons, in a way, if, if there is some sort of regulation, I assume, I, I don't know how it would work. But I think if you love sex so much that you would like to get paid for it, and you're willing to do the act, then I don't see an issue in that. I thought completely different about it. Once I had to like, talk to a brothel keeper, and she was explaining like, a lot of the people that are involved with it. I think the issue in the line obviously gets drawn when it becomes human trafficking, where it's like, where do we? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think, I think there's no way Personally, that I could see sex work of any kind for either women or men as, you know, this empowering thing. That said, if it is for whatever the reason what a person chooses to do to put food on the table and pay their rent, and I think it's better for society at large, given the intimate nature of the work and the way you can make other people ill or become ill yourself or be harmed physically or emotionally, that uh, regulation is probably the way to go. People aren't gonna stop having sex. And there are some people who, for whatever the reason, choose not to or cannot have it in, a, in the bounds of a sort of relationship. So uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't have a huge moral concern about it. It's not anything I've ever done or would be interested in doing, but I think as long as humans wanna do it, 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 actually, it actually is a public health issue to me. Hmm? How so? Because the stakes are so high, even if it's done in in a a context that's devoid of of a relationship where people bring expectations. I mean, you can physically infect somebody with an illness if one of the two parties have it. One of the two parties can be harmful and not respectful and can coerce things that are not wanted or agreed upon. I mean, not that any of these things can't also happen in a relationship, but if it's going to be in some way something that is out in the public realm as opposed to behind closed doors, I I think it is actually legitimately a public health issue. I mean, that doesn't mean that I think it's more important than trying to to provide support for victims of domestic violence of all kinds and obviously sex goes into one of the, you know, it's one of the ways that people control one another in an unhealthy relationship. I don't know how we got here. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna back- <laughs> I don't know how we, because you said prostitution was just legalized in New York. And actually you were talking about the drug dealing um, business. And I just watched Kingsman 2 last night, the movie. And that that's where my head went immediately because I don't know, have you seen it? No. Okay, it's actually great. It's a sequel that's actually pretty good. It's weirdly different from the first one. But um, Julianne Moore, who's great, plays this character who's like this hippy dippy drug dealer and she's sort of positioned as the drug dealer for the whole world. She's got a monopoly and, and she plays it brilliantly because she, she sort of plays it as a cute, sweet, you know, really a badass who grinds people into hamburger who cross her, but smiling the whole time and her makeup is done. And she's so cute, um, but uh, she she was saying, "I am the most successful woman in the whole world, this most successful businesswoman, and no one knows it." So, um, not to give away too many plot points, but she demands recognition from the president of the United States 
and legalization of the drug trade and you know has a, a nefarious plot of course to ensure that it takes place see, I went anyway, to school it's a good for, film you should see it it's good I've, I've talked about this multiple times i went to school for chemical dependency because i my my town was riddled at one point with opioids so i was losing friends left and right and then after right. listening to a podcast i have completely changed my mind on the term of addiction um mostly because i don't think i I don't think you're addicted to the drug. I think you're addicted to whatever's making you use that drug. Um, Dr. Carl, I think his name's Hunter. Carl. Oh, no, you're not talking about the professor from Columbia, are you? I don't know if he's the professor from Columbia. Okay, keep going. Sorry, I, I have, a, I have a, a trigger point for this one guy. Let's see. Let's see where wait, we are. Wait, the African-American guy? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's him. What's wrong with him? Strongly about, okay, this, okay. You want to I agree with what he says about Dr. Drew. There? I do, when he when he when he said he didn't like Dr. Drew, I was like, why couldn't you like Dr. Drew? And then he goes because he did celebrity rehab, which is basically preying on someone's pain and trying to support or get themselves better. They're exploiting that for TV. And I was like, that's why the world's fucked up is because we enjoy yeah. reality Everything television exploited on TV and people watch it. That's expensive. horrible. It is horrible. And uh, yes, I. Why do you hate him? I, I, I don't hate him. I've never met the man. I well, deeply I'm deeply concerned by his thesis. You know, I agree with you. Fundamentally, addiction is about a whole host of underlying problems and people medicate, they self-medicate in different ways. And a lot of them are extremely unhealthy. I think <laughs> I, I buy the argument that, okay, well, alcohol and, and, and increasingly marijuana are legalized in, in certain places and they do terrible damage. And drugs such as opioids are not legalized and they do terrible damage. And so let's actually look at this in a different way. I think there is a fundamental difference in the way that opioids tend to act on the body. You know, alcohol is very addictive for some people. Opioids are much more addictive for far more people. If what I have read in the science is right, I am no expert on this, Robbie. I don't claim to be, but I think him saying that it's you know, we need to look at people who use opioid drugs much the same way as people who recreationally choose to use alcohol is dangerous because I think a lot of people actually can't can't withhold um, from the, the descent into full-on addiction to opioids. It's just, it's a different chemical process in the body. I um, think the way I was looking at it when he was talking about it was more on the side of when you use opioids is probably because you're trying to reduce a pain in something and it masks the pain and makes it go away, oh, which is yes. the same thing you use for alcohol when you're talking about depression yep. or sex. I'm like talking about sex before or food. Yeah. Well, right? if you, if you uh, look at physical, shopping, well, shopping, the, hoarding, all the, these things. the issue is if you were going to ask me where I would fund a billion dollars into, I would fund it more into mental care rather than physical um, care um, much because your mental, I, there's just something different about it. Obviously, if we talk about chemical reactions between different drugs and we're going to compare it to alcohol, there's difference between physical pain and mental pain. Mental pain is very, very hard to fix. And sometimes you never you recover from it. those things. I yeah, know. that's the issue. Now, here's and what people can hide it. And I know it's really, I mean, I, I've in my close family have seen some really terrible struggles. So I'm, I'm with you on that. And I think it's very poorly served in the United States. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, we can talk about a whole another thing about eight hundred and fifty million dollars that was given to mental health to Bellazio's wife, who just lost it. And then when I brought that up to someone, saying, "Can you believe this shit?" Because there's only a couple trigger things I think in my whole entire arsenal that you could hit where I will strongly feel a certain way about. Mostly, I'm open minded to everything, but that's mental health. I think that people want to attack a core issue and not focus on the steps of why people are leading to this situation, which also leads to a gun ban, which I've gotten into a debate about. People go like, well, you can't ban guns. I'm not pro banning guns. I don't give a shit if you want to own a firearm, but you need to have precautions and certain measures set in place to make sure that someone doesn't grab a gun and blow their fucking brain out. Well, That's all I'm well, saying. Or it's somebody else's. I mean, I think, yes, I, I think there's a lot of issues with the gun debate. Well, that's. I also think the kind of gun. I think certain kinds of gun. There's, there's no reason for people. You don't to need have to probably own an LG, pistol. but there's, it's your. There's it's, no need. It's your I right know, to have one. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna fight. We can't. You can't fight that fight. With the fight, you got to talk about is that there needs to be something that is stopping the mental health 
decline in in the states and all over the world. It's getting experienced more and more and more. That comes from isolation, but it also comes from yeah. a factor of there's where I've talked about this. I'm pretty sure I mentioned it to you. Is we're entering an era of schizophrenia, and that comes with the idea of what social media is also doing, and the internet is being able to do, which is really looking into all these things that have been going under our eyes for so long. If I would have told you, or I would have told my grandparents that, hey, Bohemian Grove is real. And they go, what? what you, what's, what's Bohemian Grove? A bunch of main giant heads of state Congress leaders that sacrifice a little straw man in front of a giant effigy of, a, of an owl. And they're like, what? I don't know anything about this. Are I, you I, shitting I'm me? And you think the grandparents and age, you but... think the the landing <laughs> on the moon is fake if you don't know about this? I don't think it's fake. I mean, you think it's real? Are you kidding me? I know it's real. So Alex Jones, <laughs> and ever I mention his name, people will laugh, and that's okay. But I've I'm not going to say he's wrong about everything he said, besides the Sandy Hook thing aside, but everything he's predicted, 10 of the 15 things have came true. And there's a meme picture that I saw where the 10 of the things he's gotten correct, and then it says, you are here. And this was this just happened on April 15th. It was the monkey-human hybrid. Did you see that, that they were able to grow human organs inside of a monkey? I did not. Okay, so this was like, this was... I don't, this is huge news, at least when I came across it on Twitter. I even looked it up. It's on NPR. It's on all these giant sites saying- I've been under a rock, Robbie. Clearly. Well, it's it's <laughs> like, imagine if your liver was bad and then they decide like, hey, we can grow a liver in this monkey, then harvest it out of the monkey and then give it to you so you have a brand new liver. That's that's the that's the process of where they want to take So this. is the liver actually- it's a human Monkey liver tissue or did they, it's, they took, they took human, human liver tissue. cells and, and cult, uh, cultured them inside yeah, the that's body what they of did. the monkey. Yeah. Well, to me, that's a human, that's a human result. It just, it's like having a surrogate. Child. Okay. But five, right? six years ago, when he said it, people were like, you're freaking nuts. And if I, if you would have read that, that he predicted that, and this was five years ago or something before that information came out, yeah. I'm like, that's insane. But he got it right. And he predicted this like eight, nine years ago. So everything he said has came true, such as like the meme that always gets mean where he goes, they're making the frogs gay, that whole entire. It's not as insane as the way he says it. See, that's how he that's how he says things is he gets so outrageous, which is why I say we're entering an era of schizophrenia. This man has been so involved in government conspiracy theories, all these types of things, which is what the world's starting to turn into now, where they're starting to literally rip each other apart. I mean, the main thing, like if you want to take it, for instance, your own country as being a symbol of God, for instance. Back in the ancient days, these people built up statues to the gods, prayed on them or prayed to them. And then after a while, they started to contest them. And then they started taking these statues down. They started destroying them because they started tearing up their beliefs because they, they felt they were wiser or stronger. Oh, or, than the next, or, or the next administration, so to speak, would come along and take down the statues of the prior one because they often had the faces of the current leaders, yeah. these gods, right? So well, it's, yeah. it's all about trying to claim for I would say an essence of power and an aspect of things. Yeah, Eventually, to, you, to, to legitimize it exactly in you, divine you, right. You see that translation now with, for instance, the religious population. There's a, a lot smaller of a religious population than there was back in the day when, you know, now that we have all this culture and all these different religious influences, there's about 47 or 52 percent of the population that just doesn't know what to believe in. And if they choose to be religious, they choose to worship at home. So it's an aspect of like, Faith is needed, I feel like, for the starting steps, and then it's still needed amongst some people for sure. But then I'll, eventually you start to get to this point where you start doing things for yourselves and you start entering a new civilization or a new era where faith isn't the main dominant thing anymore. I think that's a good starting block. But for Alex Jones, for instance, it's just, if, you want, if you want to talk about the government and then being like God – People had so much faith in their government at the start, and now it's starting to crumble because now people have a bunch of information, and now they feel like they've been lied to, which starts to create an era of schizophrenia where you don't know what to believe. So when someone tells you the government says one thing, and the next thing you know, they're wrong. And this all leads into the podcast I was listening to. He, he was talking about the corruption in China, and I think we've all kind of known that China has like, oh, they block a couple of channels. They do a, no, it's a bit more than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they actually, I think it was in April, April 20th. Uh, I think this was in 2020. They sent a 13 ton um, a shipment uh, on, on a ship with human hair and the United States had seized it and then sent it back. And people are like, why did they send a thing of human hair back? Was because it 
they got human hair and we know them to have concentration camps in China, these slave camps. And we're like, oh no. So we don't get involved. We just wipe our hands and say, we're not going to do that. Cause I think any logical person or ethical person is not going to want to put another person's hair on their head, knowing that it came from a slave camp. Do you think those people would be compensated for their hair? No, 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 that's not happening. They're shaving it right off and then sending it over. So did you not know that? Cause your face just was like, what? No, I'm just, I'm just thinking it just, that, that's a rather uh, uh, vivid image that you're painting. <laughs> <laughs> what human hair? I don't know how else to no, paint. No, just it. the shaving it off, and I. No, I was actually thinking. Well, what is the? What would be the market? I mean, I suppose it's for wigs, wigs. and yeah. things like that. Uh, yeah. No, I, I was actually just thinking. I, I'm on a slower speed, maybe than normal today. So I'm just processing visually, well, vi visibly. It it kind of it kind of shows the answer of like censorship, for instance. China does the censorship in a way too. So like, oh, I don't know if you remember about two or three years ago, there was a big thing with China was banning the NBA in their country, which was a main market for the NBA was China because people in China love basketball. They just love the sports. You know, they main industrial influences like the Nikes and all the a lot of the things come from that area. That's where they get it, which is really weird because if you talk about sweatshops that have been known to happen over there why the hell are nikes 150 dollars? where you're like this was all in the podcast i'm like i said people listen to this but this has been on my playlist thousands of times a day because every time i'm getting new information out of it so i'm not an expert go to that joe rogan 1640 that's the uh podcast number um but when i was hearing this guy talk he goes the nba had an issue because a person had tweeted something that china didn't like and china decided to boycott and they said that 1.4 was it million people disagreed with what this person said which could was, have been 1.4 billion <laughs> bi yeah i i, I think I mean, it's it, it probably 1.4 billion but i mean when when the guy asked the question he goes how are people um upset about what this guy said on twitter if china has banned twitter in their country like how do 1.4 billion people know what the hell's going on when they're so enclosed and the weird part is is when so this is when i talk about that there's markers left from past history to help us now that we're still kind of using tariffs for instance tariffs are a way of that we're not going to be able to stop china from doing whatever they want but we can put tariffs in place for instance to say that you if you're going to do what you're going to do you're going to have to pay for it or you're going to have right. to work do this work around so you're not just well completely... if they want the goods and if they want to sell in our market exactly yeah so when he was talking about this, he goes with the, with the hair, for instance, when we sent it back, China goes, what are you doing? They said, we understand where that hair came from, and now we don't want to do this. And this is happening right with the Asian hate movement. So the wokeness is kind of destroying a little bit of what's going on with this corruption, for instance. So these when they turned it back, Nike asked a good question. So are our Nikes, are our shoes that we're marketing from you guys, are they happen to be like slaves or sweatshop workers that are making our shoes i don't mean to offend i don't mean to offend then china says you're racist and they cut off trade that's the thing though is now you can't even ask the question in fear that if that does get leaked to the news and that does get to wait your whole government your whole system starts to seem very very racist and very very structural so now it's like we're walking on eggshells where i'm like oh shit we're destroying ourselves a little bit here with the amount of censorship and wokeness when you start censoring things when you start allowing that stuff in there you're kind of like even with the covid for instance they threw our fucking bill of rights over here out the window and no one really kind of questioned it because it was all oh, under everywhere. the guys e yeah. everywhere everywhere so um, you you start to wonder like my buddy for instance when i told him that 850 million dollars for mental health was lost by Bellasio's wife and they don't know where that money went to to help the mental health he goes yeah corruption has been known to happen i was like what's and if i if i bring up the example of china for instance we all know totalitarian government what i think we're all totalitarian but we're all like mild to medium to like it's like taco bell hot sauces there's extremely well, hot yeah, and then there's freaking mild fascism is real and it's global now it is definitely that is true i mean i would just almost just to go back for a second to this point about the sweatshops i don't think that's news to anybody i think all fast fashion is produced in sweatshops it's not possible otherwise economically and those businesses irrespective of what country is producing those products in a sweatshop environment. I mean, they're global. 
global in reach. Well, I think people are funding these things like the dude was talking about in the episode. He goes, people are funding – are unknowingly funding these things by buying cam- – there's a certain type of camera and there's a certain type of company that makes this camera that's – there, it's kind of a monopoly. It's multiple different companies when it links to like maybe your Vizio TV. I'm not saying Vizio, but like Verizon, Sprint, whatever you want to say. These It's another giant corporation. But they go, where is this money going to? And then we found out that the the money that was getting the money from us buying these products and using them in our homes was actually funding the cameras that they use in these concentration camps in China oh. where they were keeping these people there. So it's not like – it, no. People just don't have the the wantingness to know where the shit comes from. We have this big push for where our food comes from. Well, every country UK considered well, that might have- That's a luxury though, for people who have enough money to buy artisanal, local food. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I, you're raising a really interesting point, but I think it's actually a problem, which is a logistical issue as much as it is kind of a moral issue and, and um, an effort to hide. I mean, our global markets are so interconnected and complex. I think you'd be hard pressed to actually disarticulate exactly what is the path of many of these, these commodities that are moving around. Well, do you th- – my main point and my main thought is here that I've been kind of thinking about is for so long, wars have been fought with who's a bigger and stronger force. Now I'm starting to realize that this l- slow and long process that China has been rolling out is like they're going to – they're doing a cold war. They're doing a way where it's like – I think there was a point we were – they were needing our masks at one point, the masks that we were making for their country. Um, or I don't know if it might, but it might've been the other way around. They're making, well, cause for they, us. they were supplying, well, the, yeah, sort of the irony of course in Trump's America, where I was at the beginning of the pandemic was that, uh, the main market to purchase masks, which were sold out everywhere was China. And of course the, the spin on that was not, not very nice. <laughs> so yeah, so, Chinese virus, as Trump was fond of calling it. Yeah, that's what's that's the wrong way of doing it. Is that that sparked a lot of this Asian hate type thing, which led into when we decided, hey, what's going on over here with this company or this slave thing? What's going on over here? We're asking questions. They started calling us racist and decided to pull the mask thing out and say we're not selling you mask anymore. So it, it becomes an issue where it's like. How long do we just kind of sit there and accept it, or do we start trying to build a foundation in our own country? Much like all, it's a, it's, it's like the, the slowest, I would say, call. Like if you're gonna wait three days to call somebody, if you're going out on a date or something, this is like the slowest one I've ever seen. But it's like, <laughs> it's, it's fascinating to see. Like, oh my god, like we always think that fighting or wars are fought with like going over there and taking control of a place and using guns and all these types of. Stuff. They've been doing this, planning this out that's probably one, for that's one kind of war, hundreds and hundreds of years. St- strategy and the art of yeah. War and I'm just I'm generalizing for the guys. sake of a podcast, Karen. Come on. Oh come on! Oh come on! trying to get to the slave thing. I'm trying to get your thoughts on this, where it's like, what the, like the China thing we've been, ta- it's been stereotyped or it's been talked okay. about for generations. And then now it's just like, now people are starting, like, why are we not, why are we, so, I don't know. Like I always heard people talk about this type of thing. And I would like, uh, at least we're not in China. That's always the joke. At least we're not in China. But then when you find out what's actually going on over there, you're like, you're, you're still shocked. Like it's the same thing with the religious community, for instance. They always joke about Catholic priests, but then when the the people start looking back, like, wait, that's true. It's like, no shit. That's why there was a thing about it. And I'm just like, what is happening? My head hurts. My head hurts. I I mean, here's the thing. Slavery has existed as long as humans have congregated in societies, however small. As soon as they went beyond the clan group, which is defined by your own kind of blood relatives. I mean, this is like anthropology 101. Sorry to be so formulaic about it, but it is, it's actually a sad commentary. And and this idea people have that, oh, slavery is something that was done away with, for example, in the United States during the Civil War, after the Civil War. Well, no, actually, slavery exists in many places around the world. Um, We've we've touched on- on, um, King Leopold. the sex trade and this sort of thing. But, you know, I mean, Russia, the the, the gulags, I mean, you know, th- th- we're talking in the 1970s in Chile, Pinochet, General Pinochet. Tom Sawyer's technically slavery. Oh. He was tricking the people yeah. to do the tasks. But, you know, I mean, in the 1970s, educated people who were 
deemed dangerous because of their levels of education and, and frankly, their interest in, in um, sort of spreading the idea of democracy in Chile. Journalists who were in a position to, to get the word out to the world, they were rounded up and shot in firing squads. I did a, a, a whole piece on this, this concentration camp called Chacabuco. It's in the desert of Chile, uh, right by the border of Bolivia and Peru. And it, it's just shocking. This was the 1970s. I mean, I was alive during this. <laughs> this is mind blowing. Yeah, King Leopold in, I think it was, was it 19, I don't know if it was the 1960s, but he, did with um, where they got rubber from, with rubber trees, they were using uh, people to, well, they sent a bunch of people over there with guns, if I'm oh, not Oh, you had wrong. the Belgian Congo. Yeah, they sent people in the Congo to go with guns I mean, to go get rubber. And the, so that's, can you enlighten me a little bit more about that? Because I've talked about it, like where they wrapped rubber around people and they had them walk it back to the camp and to be able to ship oh, it. Oh, I'm afraid I can't. I don't, I don't know okay. about the specifics of that, but just that that was a really brutal colonial regime in the very recent past. I mean, colonialism is another thing that we think about. Oh, it's so quaint, you know, as an American, you think about, Bayberry scented candles and reading by the fire and the bicentennial and oh, our English roots. You know, colonialism, not only, I mean, was arguably the force that most shaped the global economy and society today, just in terms of, of the cultural impact, but you know, all these questions about what's the right thing to do about collections in museums that are in many cases, largely made up of items that were seized from former colonial territories and are held by the former colonizers. You know, um, slavery is very much a part of that. And, you know, obviously the African continent is where we see a great um, majority of that through the colonial period. And you know, it hasn't stopped. I, it might have a slightly different form. It's not the way that it, it used to be in that a person literally owned a, a, a human and could sell them on or, or sell their, their offspring and this sort of thing. But how different is it really when you look at people who are essentially enslaved to low paying work, right? In places that they just can't get out of and they're not, they're not given access to health care, whether it's physical health care or mental health care. I mean, our country, the United States, is just, it's an embarrassment in that regard. You know, I don't think there's anybody who's actually satisfied with our health care system. It costs a fortune. And the people who have the money to pay for their private health care aren't happy because they're worried it's going to be taken away. They're not happy because it costs so much. The people who can't afford it, obviously, are not happy. Um, it, it's I think it's a it's a terrible a crisis that we talk about, but why can't anybody just fix it? Why? The, why? The, the fix isn't easy. Why would you want to fix something that if it doesn't so other, affect you? We're the only country in the world who is in this situation, essentially. The only sort of, if we want to use the horrible catch-all term of first world country, which has a terrible judgmental sense to it. But honestly, Europe has many problems, but Healthcare is not one of them across all the countries, you know? And Australia, Canada, New Zealand. I can't speak to Russia. I don't know. You might know about that. China, who knows? But how about to say Canada does have a little bit of healthcare issues? I got a few friends over there that talk about the long process of trying to get help at all. It's just a task and a half. Well, you know, at I'm least I am I'm they're sure they're mostly jealous because we have an immediate response, at least in the States, when you want to go to the emergency room, you can still get access to the emergency room. But the issue is with healthcare. I think, I don't think, I think other places are doing it better for sure. But even out of the healthcare situation, everyone's suffering from something. And here's the issues when I was bringing up the point of things that were made in the past that are still going to the future. They're not thinking in the grand aspect of caring for each individual person. You want to talk about the healthcare, for instance, I've been fighting with, I had to go take John Hopkins. I didn't to mean court. to go there. Sorry. I don't know how we got on well, healthcare. John, like John Hopkins, I took them to court and I won and it was all you because, did? yeah, for you. but I, it, I'm still in the same situation I was before because when I won, you're, you're David to Goliath. No, I just got really lucky that a pandemic happened to 
they had to misplace my meeting five times. And then the judge is like, fuck it. And then we roll right into it. But the judge even told me, he said, this never happens. Like you came in here with no lawyer. You came in here with nothing. And I was like, yeah, I didn't know I was going against John Hopkins. I thought I was going against Priority Partners, a little smaller company. And they're like, no, you're going against the big dog and you won. So you're very, very That's lucky. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So the way that I won though, I won, but the medication I was supposed to get to fill me for 30 days or 31 days or whatever, they go, oh, well, we're only going to give it to you for 28 or 27. So now I'm, I'm, I'm short a couple of days. So that couple of days I'm in pain. And then it's like, well, they win, but they do it at, okay, I'm going to give you like the lowest grade possible to win. And that just comes like from what the judge was telling me. He goes, they're looking on a piece of paper. They don't know you. They don't know anything about you. They don't see your face. They don't have any connection to you or who you are as a person. They read a little quick little summary of you and they stamp yes or no. And they pass it alongside. He goes, I'm doing 50 more of these today. He goes, it's all the same yeah, it's, scenario. It's business. It's business. Well, I mean, they don't want to see your face. They don't care. That's I mean, the thing with the whole- Arguably though, I don't know that that's a terrible thing, but I think if that- if you're going to do this business where the stakes are so high, you need to do better than the least common denominator. That's a successful, uh, you know, exercise of the of the product you're promising your consumer. I mean, it's the problem isn't what's going on now. It's what the foundation that has been built up is still where it's a system still running by an old foundation where people never used to ask questions. People used to just be like, well, that's what the government true. said. That's, that's right. true. That's what my doctor says. So yeah. yeah. And then yeah. now that's it's, what my priest says. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. Now it's led into this thing where now people are starting to pick apart and be like, wait, this comes from this and this is this and this is that. So like the Bohemian Grove thing, this was a big thing about a year ago, which people will say that's a conspiracy theory. And then I showed them the video and they go, oh my God, I would have never thought because it sounds so ridiculous that a bunch of Congress people, a bunch of other like main heads of state are worshiping a burning wood man in front of a giant effigy of a stone statue of an owl called Moloch. You know who Moloch is? Moloch, it's like an owl statue. Well, tell me. <laughs> basically, it's like it's you, you know the the whole Epstein thing, Epstein Island with all the kids and all the stuff that were involved in Epstein's Island and these people have heads of state. Because are you do you not know this either? Where am I? Jeffrey Epstein, Jeffrey Epstein, the guy who suicided himself. Yeah, yes, of course I've heard of him, but I haven't heard of an island. I've heard well, of he his, had a own little island where townhouse with all the eyes lining the hall. And you know that one. I, don't so know I haven't that been one. that much under a rock. Yes, yes, he bought from a an English. Um, antique optometrist company, all these fake eyes, and he mounted them. How creepy along the wall as you walked in. So, you know, you're being watched. Well, he used to have an island where like Bill Clinton would fly out to, and they had underage girls over there. It was a bunch of human oh, trafficking going on. Not surprising. Well, yeah. The Alex Jones called the Bohemian Grove thing, and he was the one that took a video of it where all these main senators, presidents, whatever you want to call it, heads of Senate were at this place, and they were wearing robes, and they were burning a little wood effigy. It's like a giant fraternity, like the Masons, for instance. The yeah, Masons yeah. have like a fraternity or cult type vibe to them, even though some of them are not doing the bad shit unless you go into like the kooky masonry, which is like you're going there for the weird spells and stuff like that. Like that's the whole point. Well, of not bad, but I just think all of those kind of secretive rituals serve a really important social glue purpose to yeah. those organizations I would right? love to, because I would it makes you feel sacrifice. special you are really part of something that nobody else knows about that's that's the point of the Doesn't bohemian grove be thing that's the point of bohemian grove thing but the bohemian grove thing happens to be major financial government people involved in it where people are like what the hell is going on where they start questioning their government and you see a video of it, it does not hit you in the best of light where you start going, what? That's our Congress people. That's our people in the Senate. So you start questioning. And this is what happens when you have a giant grasp of technology now and the world is trying to do their, like everyone, I feel like on their own little avenue or whatever, if you're seeing a certain hashtag on Twitter or trending, you start picking apart things and you start to realize that Everything that in the past that people didn't even know about that they were just glossing over is because they didn't have the information that we have today. I mean, we talk about in the 1950s, they nobody questioned their government. Nobody, they might have questioned something no. about war. No, but that was also right after World War II you, you gotta, and you heading into the Cold finish. War. So you certainly didn't. Yeah, you certainly didn't question. Care. What? Let me get it out and then you can comment. I got a no. lot I'm trying to cover here without making me sound like I'm a conspiracy nut. 
Um, but it's it's this is this is this is the issue though is when you dive down one of these rabbit holes and you start uncovering all these types of things, it sounds so maddening. Where you start getting a little bit like how I was with the China thing, where I'm like trying to explain a bunch because a lot of people don't really know about it. I mean, it was a big shock to me when I was listening to another podcast and they were talking about plastics, how it's completely degraded our whole entire fertility rate as a species. No one really knew about that. And then they tell us that from a study in 1970 compared to the study done in 2011, that it, the percentage of fertility has dropped from 97% to 43%. And you're starting to wonder mm, where's that coming whoa. from? And that is from drinking water out of plastic bottles. You know, they used to tell you that if you leave it in a hot car, don't drink it, you could have cancer. Turns out the m amount of plastics that we're using, there's a little bit of plastic in our blood right now that we we just, we don't know, but it's going to affect our children. It's why a lot of people are suffering from uh, miscarriages. A lot of people are suffering from not being able to have kids. It's slowly this long process. And it's the same thing when you start uncovering all this type of stuff you're trying to get the word out so you're tr you're trying to act schizophrenic and that's what this world's end ending up coming to is that you don't think about a lot of these things and then when this information is revealed to you you get hit with like a slap in the face which is why a lot of people start tearing up their government a lot of eyes start going on this and they're trying to expose things and then this is when the crazy stuff really starts to happen because you might uncover some truth but then some lies get mixed in and you can't sort between the craziness to the truth because it's so hard because the way I could explain Bohemian Grove to you, a normal person would be like, that sounds fucking like a lie. And then you see the videos and you're like, that's, that's nuts, but it's true. So when we go back to the flat earth thing, it does like, not necessarily, I believe in it, but you understand where someone can create this whole thing. And then when you start, they start explaining it to you with like how I just explained to you about the government thing where you're like, I, yeah, it's the government. That's their mindset is it's the flat earth. And then you're like, I don't know. And it's like, they, they have hit this thing where they're in a hundred percent belief and they can't be told that they're wrong. So now I'm trying to rationalize flat earth to you, even though necessarily I don't believe in that. But I, I'm always happy for somebody to try to convince me of something, I, you know, as I think we discovered last time, I, I just, I just need evidence that that is convincing. Same here. I don't know. I want to see, I don't know when, how to tell if the flat earth, if we're on a flat earth, apparently. I just don't know why you'd even think about that though, because you can actually see the curve of the earth from not that. <laughs> That's what I it. said. That's so, what I said. I, I mean, you can see it. We know from uh, presuming you don't think of all of the, the NASA's accomplishments as fake, you know that we've seen the earth in its entirety. It's a hey. sphere. We know hey. Hey. how the heavenly bodies move. They're Look, spherical or roughly so. I'm not a flat earther, but that moon theory, I mean, that moon landing, come on now. Come on. Oh, no, I'm not going back there. Come on. <laughs> we did that already. That's, we did that already. We've only been to it once, apparently, <laughs> allegedly, so... Why go back? There's no need to go back. We yes, there is. You know what? The focus is now on Mars, for example, because there's there's evidence for historical sources of water on Mars, right? And what we need is a place to escape the planet that we've ruined. Can I toss a really? We good... don't need to go to the moon for the can sake of it again. Can I toss a really good theory at you? Sure. So this is my own idea because I've been talking to a lot of people. I think people probably – they give off energy. They have an energy about them. You know, if you see a, a person that has passed away, it looks like there's nothing there, like what you would maybe call a soul, for instance. But there's just no energy there. It just seems like it's a husk. Do you think that all the positive – people talk about willing it into the universe. Do you think it could create a beneficial – energy for a machine like earth to be able to benefit from creating a happy and more peaceful place and a better planet or all the negative that's been running off of from all the conspiracies and all the craziness and all the fighting and all the isolation all this stuff creates a negative energy that gets sucked into our earth maybe that's what happened with mars it's, it was running off this fucking negative thing for so long now it's this dust planet with like there was water on it no shit probably every planet what about pluto can we explore that i don't really give a shit about Pluto's Mars. too cold for water it would be ice that's what that's water though that's still water it's just ice you can't drink it so okay still, still sure ice. pluto's not it wasn't pluto demoted it's not a planet yeah anymore. that's just sad to me because i'm like it's it is sad pluto's kind of nice is it um, it's, no it's, mars i don't know well okay so i I think you asked a question about aliens. I think it would be inc 
incredibly arrogant to suggest that we were the only living species in this galaxy. I don't believe for a second that we are. Yes. I don't. I don't Thank know you. what aliens are. I don't expect that they would resemble humans. Why would they? That's also freaking arrogant. Um, Karen Bellinger, everyone. Karen I, Bellinger. It's just, well, this is common sense, Robin. Well, you agree with me on the aliens thing. Thank God. I would find it troubling for anybody who was that arrogant that they did it. I, where I sort of pull back is abductions and or reptiles. I don't do that one. All of, I mean, well, who know? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't I believe don't the reptile one, and I believe but a lot of shit. I just, I just think you know. Unless I see somebody super- blink sideways, I'm not. I'm not in. I'm not in. I just think there's just this, there's no reason to imagine that there's not sentient beings elsewhere in the galaxy. Are they scoping out Earth to try to take it over? I don't think so. Look what we've done with the place. But maybe they don't need water. Maybe they don't need clean water. Maybe they don't need, you know, oxygen. Maybe they can breathe CO2. I don't I don't know because I think they're probably not physically like we are. I think um from I've heard two really very very detailed descriptions of alien encounters and they were 200 episodes apart so almost like a full year um probably since like the last time you were on it was about that amount of time um and these people have never met each other and they explain the Mm -hmm. exact same thing like two different ages one dude was like in his 40s another kid was like my age and they explain the exact same thing in the sky that they saw these three balls of light in the night sky that like looked in the form of a triangle, but when you would move, you could see like how you could look at my hand like this. If I turn my hand, you see the dimension of it. Mm, that's mm-hmm. that's how they could, if they walked, they could see the dimension of it. And they talked about it being like a 2D thing where mm. I'm like, if you could somehow create 2D and make something inside of a vehicle look 2D from the outside and then on the inside, be like, like Chicken Little, the sky is falling shit. Like the... It, <laughs> It's a it's a two dimensional well, thing that you can see through, but once you go in there, it's a spaceship and it's all three dimensional. You're able to walk around and do stuff. Some aliens that master space travel will be able to do that. I'm just saying I've heard two very very detailed from talking to people like I'm talking to you right now that have me convinced like these people have never met each other and they saw the same exact shit. And these their stories aren't like popular. Well, but on there television. are a lot of there are a lot of stories like that. I mean, I just I just did a piece for a show called Strange Evidence on Science Channel, and it is about um, nighttime encounters with aliens or reported nighttime encounters. And there's a really common thread that people experience something that has been explained in in one way as uh, sleep paralysis, where you're kind of either about to fall asleep or about to wake up and your body is in REM sleep. And so your muscles are basically paralyzed, but your brain is still working. Or the hip hip jerk or whatever. You're (laughs) processing visual stimuli and and, um, auditory stimuli and your smells and whatever. And there is some kind of convincing theories that the brain reacts in a in sort of a uniform way to this scary experience i don't know there's also an amazing abundance of cultural examples i mean through time and across different cultures about fears about you know some kind of scary monster coming to you in your sleep and wishing you harm so this is to me it's not actually that new i i don't know maybe it's aliens maybe it's not but it's shadowy thousands of years <laughs> shadowy f- uh figure syndrome when you're like in a bed and you're looking in the corner of your room you start seeing what looks like shadow figures so it's called oh, shadowy yeah, no things. and this is this is a, a there have been documented cases of during this sleep paralysis awareness that that's you know you are your your visual um system is is processing whatever you're seeing differently because the rest of you is paralyzed i, I don't understand the science but it, it's something that's been observed many times. So. Well, these people were outside staring at this thing, so they weren't asleep. But it brought. Yeah, to no, a- no, no, no. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't suggesting it was the same. I, I was just saying, and an example that I know of where a lot of different people are having the same exact experience has been noted in this 
sort of stages of sleep. I still stand the ground of to think that we're the only ones in this universe would be small minded thinking, like much like yourself, like you were How saying, could you think that? How could you that, think that? but there are people that refuse to believe that there's anything more than what they see in front of them, you know, and I get it. Evidence is thing. I need some evidence on a lot of things too, but there are some things that are, I would say a little bit unexplainable when it comes to some concepts but of things. Galaxies just really big too. I yeah. mean, it, just, and there's multiple galaxies, but like the whole idea. I know, we're just in our own little one. Exoplanets, for instance. When I was talking to the amazing astrophysicist, Dr. Serene Nemi, she was telling me, she goes, exoplanets, the whole idea of those is trying to find what life will be suitable, but only for our species. We're not talking about right. other species. Who's to say that the aliens look anything like us? You know, there was that extraterrestrial comet that we couldn't identify as a comet or an asteroid because it didn't have ice fragmentation, which is when you see the tail of a comet, when you see that, oh, that's okay. just that's just ice coming off of the comet, which gives it the ash, which is the difference between a comet is when it has that tail and the asteroid is oh, when right. it's, yeah, just, yeah. Okay. it's just a floating that rock. But the uh, Dr. Avi Loeb, he's a astrophysicist. He talked about how there was this long pencil shaped asteroid, which was that comet that you couldn't distinguish. And he started to think it was from a remnant from an extraterrestrial civilization. And it's like, if this dude's fucking thinking about it, Neil deGrasse Tyson's talking about it. I'm starting to be like Alex Jones, where you got 10 of the 15 correct. I'm not going to say you're wrong, but I'm also not going to say you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I got you thinking. I mean, look, we're always episode. learning and discovering new things. This is not what you talk about on past preservers or um, working through yeah. time. Did I get that properly? Working over time. Working over time. We talk about it sometimes. I, I've been um, pretty active on Clubhouse lately. I don't know if you're familiar with Clubhouse, but. That's it. That's that was in the we, Josh Rogan podcast. China owns uh, that app, which is why they tried to ban TikTok at one point, because it was us putting a uh, 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 putting a stop to the whole entire um censorship and the thing that was going on over there did you know clubhouse was only available for six weeks in china and then they banned it because these yeah people in china were having conversations with people outside of china and it was yeah, like well, nope that, can't do that. Like that yeah i know it's a shame oh, I, it, clubhouse is a weird beast i don't know have you spent any time on it no because i have a podcast yeah. I, well no i mean i do too and i I think it's it's actually more of a potential time suck than television or video games or what you know you name your your time sucking poison. I'll say an episode a, an episode a day is a time suck. I don't want to do any more. Uh, yeah, it's um. That said, there there is the possibility to have a, a really kind of genuine interaction with people, which I really like. So I mean, my work is is mainly television, and so. Yes, I'm presenting for a, a broad audience, and so that's great. But it's it's static; it's one way. Um, this is really immediate, and it's a chance to actually talk to people. So, with with another person who's with Past Preservers and and does the kind of archaeological work that I do, we started this club, Archaeology and History 101, and we have rooms sort of four to six times a week, depending on how busy people are, and we particularly targeted it at, you know, it's sort of where professional archaeologists, historians, and enthusiasts just chat about stuff. So we have great conversations about things like historical fiction, you know, what's the value of that? What is it dangerous at all? You know, we, we talk about if you could have a time machine, where would you go and why? Who would you have dinner with? What would you change if you could change one thing and nothing else would change? Would but we go? also have, oh, you know what? I I actually think I would go, this is such a weird one. I thought about this a lot. I would like to go to Mahenjadaro, which is in the Indus Valley. So present day India, Pakistan. It's one of the earliest major urban centers. And it's really interesting. They, their written script hasn't been deciphered. So this is, you know, 5,000 years ago. Um, these people had an incredibly sophisticated technological society. So they managed river. They, they managed to sort of harness the flooding of the river to create incredible plumbing throughout the whole city. Everybody had, you know, baths in their homes and toilets and all of that and running sewers down the streets. And they, they used, um, we think they used oxen to kind of um, use hydraulic, you know, simple hydraulics to 
pull the water up as needed and to, to damp it down when, the, when the, the floods were too strong for their fertilizing their crops and all of this. But what's interesting is that this is a city that probably had 20,000 inhabitants and there's zero sign of social stratification. So there's no palaces. All the houses are kind of the same. You know, um, there were public areas, plazas and things like that, but there is just none of the evidence that you see, for example, in ancient Egyptian ruins of a very powerful elite and, you know, stratification down from there. So I just would love to walk around and talk to these people and, and sort of understand how their society worked. We really don't know. We also know they loved games and leisure. There are all these gaming pieces for different games that are, are hugely prevalent in the archeological record, much more than in any other ancient civilization as a percentage of overall artifact types, leisure and entertainment. So who were these people who just seem to have created, you know, some kind of nirvana? I don't know. It's, and they, they eventually um, died out, we think because of climate change, they eventually could not control the flooding you know, the rivers overflowed the bank. There's evidence for that. They had mud brick houses, which, you know, the bottoms of which have sagged down. So we see that the water level rose to a point they no longer could manage it. But yeah, I'd love to just go walk around and say, you know, okay, what did you figure out? and How'd you do it? Because they endured for a long time. I like that. It's kind of a weird one, I know, but that's actually where I would go. Because, I, you know, I, I think it's just one of those cultures which we someday, we hope will understand better once the Indus script is deciphered, but it's not yet. So we need a Rosetta Stone for there. Napoleon Bonaparte discovered the Rosetta Stone. Oh, and it, it should go back to Egypt. It, the fact that it's in the British Museum makes me sad, well, he angry. Just conquered and discovered it i guess but so yeah i know it. but they, there's no real okay so the replica did you are you surprised i knew that come on i learned that last night that has to give me like some awesome oh, no I, I i i wouldn't think any anything other than you would have known that robbie see this doesn't <laughs> surprise me but yeah it's it's a it's a fun fact um i was gonna say course, but the moon landing imperialist, thing imperialist a, but well so here's one question for you um ooh, I, mean, I got a question uh, am I not allowed to ask? You can ask me questions. It's a conversation. Well, this is what I don't quite understand. So we can make the argument, and I actually do believe that in some ways, museum collections that exist as they do today are the result of a certain historical progression of which colonialism was a big part. And that is what has brought certain items, for example, to the British Museum, just as an example, because it's got these Parthenon marbles that people I, I agree with, argue, should go back to Greece because Greece is asking for them, A, and B, actually has the means to care for them in equivalent fashion now, which wasn't always the case. So there's no argument that it's to preserve them for human posterity to enjoy and appreciate because uh, Greece is fully well and capable of doing that now. But, you know, this the Rosetta Stone is the key to the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And Egypt just opened a phenomenal new national museum or, or they're they in the process of moving things from their old museum, which was pretty dismal. I have to say, I went, I visited a long time ago and it, you could touch everything. <laughs> it's just like crazy. There was no air conditioning, um, but they've really, they've, they've fixed that. So they've got a replica of the Rosetta Stone there. The British Museum has the original. They look identical. You know, what's your question? They've been asked to return it. Is it correct for the British Museum to hold on to the original when the Cairo Museum is displaying a replica, which is identical, which has all the information that one needs to understand what the Rosetta Stone was about and why it was important? But the Egyptians want it back. I mean, that's just, there's no reason that it's not sent back. It makes me very upset. What do you think about that? I'm going to give you two answers, but before I do that, I do want to touch on, I want to talk to some of your archaeologist friends to see if they can handle my brain. Um, Cause you mentioned the clubhouse thing and I was like, I, I would love to well, chat. I, I, or you, or you're on clubhouse. Just I'll send you an invite to the club. Send you me their just Twitter. Come to some of the I don't clubs. want, I don't want to support China in any way right now. You're not supporting China. You're supporting me. 
I support you on Twitter. I'll like all your stuff and I'll share everything. I promise. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but um, when it comes to that answer of that question, I think it should go back, um, especially if they have a replica. But I also see why they're keeping it is because it is technically also a part of their history now, too. Um, no, I mean, that's, that, that's, there is that. There that's, is that. That's, that's where you're not going to have, not like, enough. they're not going to give it up. They're not going to give it to them. So I would say, why don't we create a stalemate here and just work together to recover whatever, understand some of the hieroglyphs that maybe aren't understood by using the actual one or using whatever one or using whatever process that you could possibly maybe even do it better. But do a workaround here. You guys got to work together. You can't just say no or say yes or say this. You have to find a, an agreement here, much like anything that goes on. When we talk about attacking a core problem, what are the steps and things where we can both get what we want in a beneficial and processed way? And that's not how the world is running when any country. Yeah. So there's got to be a winner and a loser. I, well, I was watching, I was getting a couple of months ago heavily into the courts, just the whole court system, which I thought I was already in before when it came to people being wrongfully in prison, but noticing how much of like, it's exactly like a movie. It's all about who can be a better conversation person who can just sway the jury in whatever way they want it to fit, whether it's true or not. And I realized this is a foundation that is built upon just wanting power and just wanting to be this thing. And that's not only in the States, that's everywhere. And I'm like, I, yeah. The issue is, is like when you're talking about, for instance, going back in time and seeing that village or seeing all those people that are somehow working together, that didn't have any uh, evidence of these giant dictatorships or anything that would seem like someone had more power than another person, much like a person that owns a one story home compared to a person that owns a four story with a mansion and a pool and a bunch of flamingos. Um, peacock. Peacock. What about dodo birds? I, that's my mascot. Oh, a dodo bird would be cool to see. Because he's so completely misunderstood by people. How do you know? Because um, I watched – okay, I'm not going to lie though. I watched a really, really uh, – it's a documentary, but it's an animation of a documentary. So it was like – All for, I know about Dodo Birds, I know from Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. So everyone – made a good croquet mallet. So what people are starting to <laughs> discover, paleontologists are starting to discover, is that maybe the Dodo Bird, Dodo Bird wasn't an idiot. They all inhabited one island, so they didn't have a natural prey or predator. They just kind of had each other. They ate fruit and stuff like that or whatever was around on the island, bugs or these certain things. And these English settlers came over and they the dodo birds walked up to them because they've never encountered danger or anything that would resemble danger. So they were so open to walking up to them, much like you would meet like a little, uh, I don't know, a baby deer would walk up to you if it had the chance and you weren't driving a car or something. <laughs> And these English settlers eventually got hungry and decided to eat these dodo birds, and they didn't save one or two. They killed all of the dodo birds. So that it must have been delicious. Probably really good, like chicken, maybe, um, or game, maybe. <laughs> but that's where I use the dodo bird as my mascot, is because a bunch of people think it's this idiot. So I'm like, I don't. It's they're starting to not see that as the thing anymore. They're starting to see that it was so pure that it was eventually just killed off because it didn't have any prey. It wasn't afraid of anything. It wasn't trying to live in fear. It was trying to communicate, which is like you're talking about the civilization. They communicated. They understood each other. It's natural. It's this aspect of wanting to have a community. But what happens when your community gets too large? What happens when your community gets infected by something? The thing is, I want to find out what that source is. I think people are, are inherently good. I don't think anybody's really bad. I like if I asked you the question I've been asking a lot of people is, do you think anybody is unredeemable? And in my eyes, I consider everyone's redeemable, no matter what your act is. I think there's a process and there's a way to get you back to thinking clearly. But do we have the time? Do we have the effort? Do we have the supplies? Do we have the manpower to be able to do I think so? The problem isn't thinking clearly. It's thinking morally. It's thinking empathetically. Yeah. I, 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 I would like to believe, I mean, I am an optimist and I definitely, my, my default is to give people the benefit of the doubt, but I do think there are people who don't have the best interests of others at heart and can't, because I, I do think there are, call them personality disorders, call them whatever you want. I think there are some people who are wired differently than the majority of people and yeah. I, I don't think they don't deserve sympathy and support and help, but will everybody with all the effort in the world come around to be the person you, you think they, they could be? No. My main, Sadly, I, I, 
<laughs> my main point in that is that I think technology will get to the point where we'll be able to do a way better job at analyzing that. My issue is, is that there was um, a FedEx shooting that happened a couple weeks ago. And my buddy, good friend of mine, um, was involved with that uh, FedEx oh. shooting that happened. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't know it was in his town. I didn't know it was in, we did an episode on it. We talked about it, uh, 770 for anybody listening, but, uh, he, he no longer worked there, but his son, he was picking his son up that night that it happened. He left 30 minutes before the shooting started. And oh he talked God. about the kid used to work there. The kid was upset. Apparently they cut him on a paycheck and you start seeing all these new, like this evidence that is understanding why this person could do this act. Cause when the initial act happened, everyone's like, why, what the hell is wrong with this? And considered him a psycho. And it was like, you start to notice all these little blocks that build up to what the problem was. And that's when I start talking about the gun thing. And that's when I start talking about the mental thing. There is a mental decline that is happening faster and faster where there's kids at seven and eight years old that are starting to have severe depressive disorders when maybe you had one or two back in the day that was like okay there's that kid i think we all know the person that used to hiss in school remember that where the you would walk up hey how you doing kathy and kathy's like and you're like holy shit um see you later kathy. <laughs> but you know what i'm talking about but um there was always that one person that was a little bit different or had something about them but now it's becoming a lot of the majority. And I think that does happen to do with a lot of isolation and the amount that there is so many people now that there is a big disconnect between a lot of being able to talk to every single person. Let's take your community, for instance, that one community that you were mentioning. It's so small, so knit. Like if let's say me and you lived in a town or a population of a thousand people, we would know our neighbors. We would understand our people a little bit more. We would have probably more community meetings that we would all attend to be able to decipher where we're going in life because of the aspect of we're more tightly knit together compared to now where there's people on top of each other, where it's suffocating a little bit, where people do want that isolation. And the sad part is when you get that isolation, you necessarily don't want it. You kind of want still the community conversation. I mentioned this with families, for instance, seven days in a house with even your own family, somebody's reaching for a butter knife. You got to understand is that you need your breaks, but you also need the time with people as well too. And sadly, everyone's so glued to connection through social media, which is like, if you've ever seen yeah, and that's fake connection. That's exactly. Really problematic, so, so if you've ever seen uh, Clash of the Titans or Wrath of the Titans, I freaking love those movies. I haven't. But they talk about Hades, for instance. When Hades enters the throne room, he's all covered in a black cloak, covered in dust and ash. And he goes, Zeus and all you other gods have lived on the praise of all these people, but nobody ever prays to me. I've lived off the fear. It's still power, but it's diminished power. And I think that's the same thing with the connection, that satisfaction you get from like me and you having a conversation. It's conversation because we're talking together right now. And I mentioned this to a molecular neuroscience guy, and he was like, that's that's a good example. And I'm like, thank you. I feel intelligent now. Um, so I know this is a, this is a long time ago, uh, way before we talked, like 400 episodes before. But we um, I was I was I was bringing up the example. I think that social media, this connection is kind of like with Haiti saying I've learned to feed off the pain and misery rather than the love and admiration, the love and admiration, like I was saying with the earth. The happiness, the peace might be a better suitable battery to run on, but we've been running off of this slow, diminished off-brand energizer battery that isn't really – it might show off as energizer, but it's not energizer. It works half as long. It, it's, it works half the speed, and I think that's what ends up getting forced in all around us. I think people inherently have this energy about them. I know that I can sense at least when I walk into a room, I can sense that, okay, something's going on in here, as in like somebody pissed off you can kind of sense mm. that whether they're throwing shit around you pick up the vibes mm. i think people inherently need that connection but the connection we're getting is through social media and it's doing a half-assed job at fixing the problem or filling that hole that needs to be filled it's not really a good one that's why i usually feel a lot better me and you messaging back and forth for instance okay when you want to do a podcast blah, blah, blah. those I don't, i'm not feeling any connection from that but then once i get into a podcast with you i can see your face i can see that you're like this this kid this kid's all over the map i can see that in your face and it gets me a little like excited it gets me happy it gets me like i'm having a conversation even though i it's all good fun. around the world which is what's great i mean it's 
so you start to realize that these things that we build up to make our lives more comfortable and easier are necessarily destroying some minor things, much like with plastics, for instance, the use of plastics contaminating us a little bit and hurting our repopulation methods. Technology is kind of making it fun and easy, but after generations upon generations, now generations being born that all they know is this, it's hurting them. It's a little bit different. And the one thing that we can look at China, for instance, they didn't have the application to have landlines. They went from land, they went from no phones at all to just straight cell phones in their pockets because the government decided that they can have that in there. Well, and I think India is much the same. You That's know? I mean that, there's a there's and, a, it, but we always look at them as like, why is their community and family a little bit more tightly knit together? And it's like because they had all they had was each other. They didn't have cell phones, okay, they didn't have they all didn't these have things. they didn't have limitations of one child for a while, too. So families are larger. I would argue that's a huge Back they're, well, they're incentivizing now in Singapore for them to have kids. The government's paying. Yeah, people it's to have so kids. interesting. Well, yeah, it's because of the plastics. <laughs> That's what they said. Is that they've been using plastics at twice the usage that we have in, hmm. in the states. So now it's harder for them to have more than one kid, even though that they that was their thing. Is like they want one kid, whatever. My buddy, the flat Earth guy I was mentioning, lived in Singapore for ten years, and he talks about how like the government would pay you. To have kids, more than one. Mm. They wanted to increase mm. the population because it's so hard for them now. Mm. So wow. there's ramifications to everything that gets created. The issue is, is like when someone says, oh, my Wi-Fi is out. You didn't really care about your Wi-Fi until it was created. So what you're saying is now that the problem is fixed, the problem would have never been there if it wasn't created in the first place. Technology is initially invented to do inherently good things, but then it gets taken down another rabbit hole, such as AI enhancement or artificial intelligence. You see methods of giving a person new legs, but how long until someone's like, damn, that dude's got robotic legs. Well, I can get robotic legs. How do I do that? Well, I got to break my legs off. That sounds <laughs> insane, but someone would do it. Probably. I don't know. Not People me. light themselves on fire I, I, for car bad, insurance I've money. I've got bad knees. I, I would never never try to damage i work just to keep him there are plenty accounts of fake insurance fraud where a person rigged his car to blow up while he was inside of it to get insurance money that doesn't so. sound very smart to me but i'm i'm sure you're right that's people though you give somebody the option to have the internet in their head like a neural link it's going to take maybe a week or so before they start looking up anything they want to on the internet and it's not going to be the best of things oh dear well i don't think we're going to solve the world's problems this time either robbie Sorry. That's not what this podcast was about. This podcast was to get <laughs> go somewhere and we went somewhere, but we did. Well, thank you for having me on again. I actually have to go and get ready for my next conversation. Got another <sighs> podcast after me? No, no, it's not actually. It, it's talking about having a conversation. Um, I'm working with people <laughs> I'm sorry. to I'm sorry. No, talking no, we're, about we're... having a conversation, but we no, just we had are. the craziest we are. No, we're one. Planning. For a I conversation, know. you know, Anne Boleyn, um, the famous wife of Henry VIII, who was beheaded after he pursued her so hard and divorced his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, uh, so that he could marry Anne to have a male heir to the Tudor throne in England in the 15th century. And she, three years after their marriage, was beheaded. He accused her of adultery and all sorts of things that probably she didn't do it so she's one of these kind of um lightning bolt figures in history very popular i mean wildly popular the whole tudor fandom and then that's really what it is is huge and and that's largely because of the huge um uh, outpouring really in the past decade or so of popular media so there's there's a there's a play that's out now a musical called six which is based on his six wives, King Henry VIII, and you know the Tudors, the TV series with um, what is his name? I can't remember his last name. His first name is Reese. Anyway, he's quite good looking. He doesn't look like Henry VIII, but anyway, um, it's endless historical fiction. But so we're going to try to figure out on Anne Boleyn Day, as it's called, which is May nineteenth. It's the anniversary of when she was beheaded. How to have a new conversation about Anne Boleyn because it's one of the most talked about historical topics ever. So that's what I'm on to next. Out of everything I've said, that seems more interesting than the China and buying our education system. We didn't even get to. It's not more interesting. It's just different. Okay. It's just 
I, I, I like old history. I like Atlantis I'll let and you all know those how ideas. How it turns out. How it turns out. All right, Karen. Well, I appreciate you for giving me your time today. Where can people? Oh yeah, I got to mention before we go. Um, your bio, for instance, on your Twitter, you have past preservers tagged. I'd click it because it's not the past preservers you wanted tagged. Oh, what it's am some, I clicking to? Some Chinese guy. <laughs> it's not. If nice. you click, click on your Twitter right now and click on the I'm past so preservers surprised. thing. Normally, that's the kind of thing my agent would have flagged. Thank you. He's so. Do you see what I'm talking about? about? Exposure. I haven't looked, but I will. Give Thank him a shout you. out. What's his name? Oh. Uh, Nigel Hetherington, who is past preservers. It's his. It's his firm. He's actually an archaeologist too. He. Um, worked on king tut and all of that stuff in egypt but now he he corrals people like me on tv so and have, other public media i'm gonna give this guy a shout out but you have this guy tagged on your thing his name is Uto. Uto. oh i'm sure he needs he just needs it that's See, hilarious look at his name past preserver oh, i don't have an s on it all right i gotta go find i gotta put an s on look at that i'm helping you out robbie you're the best but you're funding china so what is wrong with you no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, I'm if you don't know you're doing it, does it count? Thank, thank you. I'm going to fix it right now. Look, you're right. Oh. I, I got you. All right. Well, thank you for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. And stay tuned for another episode.